I think it's important to focus on the fact that when in, in China's ascendancy, call it post 2001, post WTO ascension, they were growing much faster than anyone else in the world, right? And what they were doing is they were they were taking growth from their other ASEAN neighbors, right? Uh, they were competing for growth uh, with their own workforce uh, and their own uh, burgeoning uh, technology industry. Uh, and what you're seeing now is the law of large numbers catching up to China, where uh, they're going to end up going from from eight to seven to six to five, all the way down to two or three. We think they're growing at, uh, if you look at the actual numbers, we think they're growing uh, at about 2%, uh, 2.5% last year, and, and maybe somewhere between zero and two this year. And I think it's important to note that China won't be able to grow faster than the rest of the world now that things uh, on the labor side have equalized. And that has a lot to do with their current account. And, and you showed that other chart uh, of China's dollar shortage, which we focused on. Um, when, you, when we think about China, we think about it in two different ways. One is uh, domestically, and domestically, they control the printing press. They control the price level, the police, the narrative. And how many times, Keith, have you been sitting with someone and they say, but it's China. They can kind of do whatever they want to do. Yeah. And I say that's true domestically to a certain extent. Uh, but the real issue here is, uh, and this is Hong Kong, but I want to, I want to keep going on China for a second. Um, the real issue is in China, um, you've got the situation where they, on cross-border currency settlement, uh, if you look at BIS data, that it only represents nine tenths of 1% of all global trade and cross-border trade settlement. And they purport to be 15% of global GDP. So China's problem is they still have to interact with the rest of the world. And as they interact with the rest of the world, they have to buy crude oil, they're short crude, they're short energy, they're short food, they're short basic materials, right? They're short many things that they actually have to buy uh, to keep their GDP growing internally. So if they're showing GDP growth internally, they still have to continue to purchase things with their dollar balances or their FX balances. And so, Keith, the way that they've been plugging that hole for the last couple of years is coercing people like MSCI and uh, the Bloomberg uh, Barclays Global Ag Index uh, to shovel dollars to China because their current account's gone flat and, and we think secularly going to be negative uh, from now on. So China's real problem is, is now the rubber's meeting the road. You say is secular meeting cyclical? And the answer would be, we would still have cyclical uh, impulses in China if we didn't have this secular problem. And the right. secular problem is they're running out of dollars. Yeah. And as soon as the w world figures that out and the U.S. intelligence and, and uh, presidential cabinet figures out that they're running out of dollars, they realize that in these negotiations, the U.S. holds all the cards. Well, in that, uh, in, in that regard, that's, I mean, that's the next step. There's multiple uh, different uh, you know, paths we can take off that, that platform for the discussion, and we will do Hong Kong in full. Uh, but on that point, like, do you think that the, the Fed or the president or both understand the gravity of this dollar illiquidity problem and that we truly do hold the cards and, and, and that we can control the situation overtly if we, if, if we would prefer to. Uh, and I guess the second part of the question on that is, why would they? Because um, obviously if they were to step on it the, the wrong way, they'd step on a lot of things in the stock market the wrong way too. Yeah, so it's a good, good, good point. So our president behind the scenes is very focused. He's intensely focused on the stock market, if you can't tell. Um, his people <laughs> behind the scenes tell me that he doesn't want to do anything that could potentially jeopardize the stock market. And so the answer to your question is, uh, even if he may understand that he holds all the cards and the U.S. holds all the cards, I'm pretty sure that what Trump's looking for pretty much at all times is, quote, a deal. And uh, that deal may not be synonymous with, say, the long-term betterment of our, of our nation. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, Mnuchin's probably looking to uh, finance his next movie by the Chinese when he's out of the Treasury Secretary position. And so uh, Mnuchin's kind of co-opted by, uh, one, one might say, uh, the, the evil power. So if you're asking if they're going to go ahead and throw that switch, uh, I don't think they will. But I do think that there are many other agencies within the U.S. Uh, that can do things administratively uh, and even legislatively, like you saw in the in the Hong Kong uh, Democracy and, and uh, Freedom Freedom uh, uh, and Democracy Act, 
which passed with uh, a verbal vote in the House, i.e. an overwhelming supermajority. Uh, and when it gets to the Senate, I think you'll see a potential veto-proof majority, there, uh, supermajority there, uh, which will make it much tougher for the president to uh, execute his own agenda without, uh, without uh, that of Congress's opinion. And so you're going to see things happen from here, Keith, that are outside of the president's control. Yep. And uh, those are things that are going to be really important to pay attention to.